You're hanging out in the House of Sunny podcast, where it's always sunny, mostly because of your host, comedian and YouTuber, Sunny Loman. Want to know what Sunny and her friends are thinking about this week? Well, here she is, Sunny Loman. I think this is our 50th show, Doug. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Woo! Woohoo! 50th anniversary. I actually think that this is our one year show, but I'm not sure. <laughs> That's how organized I am. I should be celebrating our uh, our anniversary, but I don't even know when it's happening. I'll give you the same gift I gave my wife for our anniversary. What's that? A headache? More journey. More journey? Journey like, is the reward. A, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a great journey with you on this podcast. <laughs> oh my god, wow. that is so that's so hippie. Hey, that's you know, we, why do we need material things? Yeah. All right, here it's we go. It's all about experience. So hey, welcome everybody. I'm back from my month offline. I've got some observations to make about that, and I'm here with sidekick Doug. How was it running the show for a month? Uh it was splendid. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah, without you. In the way of, <laughs> of, of my brilliance, you yes. know, I was able to just, you just shower. <laughs> you let loose on your brilliance, which I normally, t- I, t- I tamp it down a little bit. You do. You, I, I'm like a caged beast that <laughs> you're, but no, it was fun. It was, it was hard. I mean, it's kind of hard to run, run yeah. it. I'm obviously not very experienced at it. So we had some good moments. You it's know, harder where, than it, it's, it's harder than it looks, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah, people don't definitely. realize how much work goes into it, how much energy it takes, how, uh, the skills that you have to build up to actually make it sound like you're having an effortless conversation instead of a awkward, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, right. Uh, you and I were talking about it offline, but you have to imagine having, for all you listeners out there, imagine you're having a conversation with a friend, but you're, half your mind is kind of elsewhere, like you're expecting a phone call or an email or something like that that's important or, you know, something is distracting you. And that's what it's like being on a podcast because you have to, in the back of my mind, I always have to imagine what am I going to talk about next? Where are we going with this? What time is it? How long have we been talking about this? Is it entertaining? Is it going well? Do I need to shut everybody up? You know, it's like I'm, I'm having to manage and simultaneously sound engaged. (laughs) So, you know, you know what, where you'll really gain respect is when you watch uh, a TV show or a radio show or other podcasts where they're really good and they always have like a question like there's re- there's never any awkward pauses on yeah. Tucker Carlson or something like that where the guest stops talking and Tucker's like um um okay well here we go you know right, right. it's oh, just TV, seamless yeah, at all times they're I mean, so good at it think about it like we have this long form hour what if it was you know a 5 minute segment and yeah. I had to like keep it snappy as well as profound. Oh my god, those people so are good. genius. And the you know a lot of podcasts edit, and we don't edit, so you know we're not editing out the awkward stuff. We're just leaving it in there to marinate to marinate our <laughs> listeners in awkwardness. That's a function of our laziness too, <laughs> and our lack of tech technical ability. Well, it's just that that's so time consuming. I just wasn't it willing is. to do it. You know, I'll edit a video to death for 10 hours, but I'm not willing to do that for a podcast. And that's an hour. It's an hour of footage. You know, when I work on a video and get a video from 20 minutes of footage down to five minutes, that can take me from seven to 40 hours. That's not Uh a joke. Seven to 40 hours to edit 20 minutes of video. So imagine you have an hour of podcast. And then the other thing I think you get is you get too picky and you start to like edit it so much that it, I don't know. I mean, I could just yeah. edit forever because this isn't very organized or planned. And so there's all kinds of flaws. Right. Hey, uh, so let's start with our joke. We've got a joke from our joke man. And actually, he, he sent this for you to play on the show and you just didn't. So I'm using that one because he didn't send one for me this week. So joke man, what are you doing? You got lazy this week. And hey, I'm going to I'm going to 
tell my own joke at the end of the podcast. So that's your teaser. That, so you have to listen to the whole dang thing to get my joke. But also, if you want to tell us a joke for next week, call the number 707-681-5834, and we'll play it. We play them all, no matter what. And it's a good thing we don't have Ben on to tell one of his dirty jokes, because they're a little inappropriate. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some high-slash-low points on the show's history <laughs> with good old Ben. Hi, Ben, <laughs> if you're listening. Okay, here's a joke man's joke. Okay, Doug, another joke for you. Man's laying in the hospital bed wearing an oxygen mask over his mouth. Nurse, he mumbles, are my testicles black? The nurse raises his gown, holds his penis in one hand and his testicles <laughs> scrotum in the other. She takes a close look and says, there's nothing wrong with him, sir. The man pulls off his oxygen mask and smiles at her and says very slowly, thanks for that, it was lovely. But listen very, very carefully. Are my test results back? <laughs> Aha! First of all, that's as dirty. <laughs> that's as dirty as Joke Man has ever gotten. He's normally yeah. very, very wholesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, good one, Joke Man. Good one. All right. The Did sm- not see that coming. Didn't see that coming either. Didn't see that coming. I like the I like the word jokes. So uh, I went. I woke up this morning and didn't. There was no coffee in the house, and I had to go pick up a cup of coffee like have you ever had to roll out of bed and actually function and drive and stuff like yeah, that that's normal people call that the going everyday. to work <laughs> i know it's a little unusual it's not for my you. life that's something you're familiar <laughs> with yeah so i get out of bed and i i go to starbucks i get to starbucks and now i know what it would be like to be 80 because i'm I'm there, and the woman asks me, you know, what do you want, whatever. And it took me, like, it was like my brain was in molasses. I was like, uh, uh, and then I was slurring my speech. I'll take a coffee with the, and I was like, oh, my God, why can't I control my speech? It's, Mm -hmm. I'm so tired and groggy. I'm like 80-year-old. But in my defense, I also took a Benadryl last night. So I think think there was some lingering Benadryl. Yeah, Benadryl's brutal. Um, yeah, I think I think they're used to it though. Like if you work at a Starbucks, right? Every person that's coming through there is groggy and angry. Yeah, well, that's the other thing know? too. I was in my sweats and I didn't do my hair. I just like put it in a ponytail and I. I mean, I don't leave the house like that. I'm not one of those people. I try to. I'd like to be one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I would like to be one of those people, but I force myself to not do that because I feel like it's a slippery slope. There's a Halloween costume someone just sent me of uh, angry mom in the morning. Or, hey, I, po- or I posted angry- that. I posted that oh, on Facebook. Okay, yeah. Okay. There was a, a young girl dressed up for Halloween, exhausted mom. <laughs> Yeah, and she's in her mom. she's in her sweatpants and her hair's in this frazzled ponytail and she's got like a like a a burping cloth over her shoulder and a baby stuck to it and another baby stuck to her leg and then yeah. in one hand she's holding a Starbucks <laughs> yeah oh, that's my I life. see that every day when you drop your kids off at school like every other mom looks yeah, like that it's really hard when I drop my daughter off at school there's this one woman that I I basically idolize she's she's always pulled together but not in a way that looks like overdone she looks very maternal and kind of sweet and but she always has rouge on her cheeks and her hair is always pulled back and she's kind of pretty and she wears like kind of a big poncho but it's like a beautiful cashmere poncho over a pair of black leggings so she's wearing the leggings but she's wearing a cashmere poncho on top of that like she looks fantastic and she has five children, and she's uh, eight months pregnant. Oh. And so all these little duckies are following her, you know, <laughs> into school. And she's this, like, poised, cashmere-wearing, blushed, you know, she's got a little lipstick on, you know? She sounds like a, a robot. I'm like, my God, you're amazing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, so I respect that a lot. I do. Like, I you res- don't realize that if you're a young man, okay, and you're listening to this, <laughs> like find that woman to right? marry. You know, whatever you think of the girl at the bar that you're attracted to, 
Like, yeah. make sure you wait. <laughs> Find the poncho, cashmere poncho wearing mom who's totally cool at 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. You'll and thank me later. She's not like, you know, she's not the girl you'd first go after in the bar. You know, she's she's not, I don't know, cheerleader pretty. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. She's a little maternal looking. Um, uh-huh. she looks kind of, she looks a little Italian actually. She's, um, but she's also pregnant. So she's probably very slender when she's, you know, but she always has nice fabrics and good color choices. And she, you know, I'm just like, I'm totally stalking this woman, by the way. She's like my, yeah. She's Maybe my, we should uh, stalk her together. Like we'll both glorify her and worship her. She's from my afar. personal hero. But I, I, th- I think that this is good advice for guys and girls. When you're dating, I think people don't, when you're 20, 22, 23, you don't take into account enough. What kind of dad and mom is this person going to be? Totally. You know, is this person mom and dad material? And if, and that may not be very sexy, but it, I think it can be. Um, she's she's very pretty. Her husband is seven feet tall, and they're physically affectionate with each other. When I see they're holding hands, when I see them and stuff, I mean they're just the most adorable family. Well, you know, there's scientific studies that have been done that show that we are actually physically, like biologically, attracted to traits that are are important or significant in yeah. child rearing. Yeah, you know, like when they do studies of like what women find attractive and. You know, the kind of there's these like smells that people uh, emanate when they're ovulating, like all this weird scientific biological stuff. But it is actually associated. So you're kind of naturally. But if you I think on like some real like direct level, superficial level, especially when you're young, you just go for the the hottest chick. You know, what's the hottest hottest chick I can get or or maybe you're you're interested in kind of. Like when you're smart like us, you're interested in intellectual compatibility. Um, that's but a mistake. E- but <laughs> I was going to say, even that's not the most important. Um, it's not. Yeah. It's funny. It's really values and just kind of like, I think productivity is a bigger draw for me. Totally. Like, and and totally. both for men and women. Like, is this woman going to get up and put on a little blush or is she going to be lazy and like me and roll out to Starbucks with with a bedhead, you know? Yeah, that might be 94 percent of it is laziness. Um, also, intellectual, you know, if you're an intellectual person yourself and you find another intellectual person, well, guess what? Two people brooding about the state of the universe <laughs> right? and considering the... The bigger picture questions of life. Oh my and the god! Universe. So true. You don't true. want that. Like you want someone who's like making dinner yeah. while you brood, cheerfully about, making spaghetti and telling skin. telling you to stop watching the news. Yes. It yeah. was like, hey, you know, I was out today and I found some flowers and we did this and we did that, and right. then you can brood about the universe in your closet or something. You don't so want true. to. That's what friends are for. You know, call your friends and brood about the universe with your friends. Exactly. That's yeah. what podcasts are for, right? That's yeah, it's it's exactly right. Okay, so how was your Halloween, by the way? Speaking of families, oh, it was fine. It wasn't as you know, my kids are getting a little older, so it's not quite as fun. But we we like totally decorated the house. We put like a giant spider web with a spider, and I got the skeleton with like a skeleton dog. Oh, cool! So like, so they're like sitting in a chair. So we had all sorts of decorations, which is cool. It was fun. How about you? Um, it was perfect. It was like the the perfect Halloween. You know what I mean? It was the perfect yeah. American Halloween. Um, my daughter's adorable. She dressed as Glinda the Good Witch. She looked cute as a button. And we went from house to house. And it, it really makes you feel good about people when mm-hmm. you get to walk up to their house and they're cheerful and they're giving you candy. and Totally. Yeah, it was super benevolent. I love Halloween. We trick-or-treated our way over to a friend's house it's actually uh, my daughter's best friend is this little boy that lives about like seven blocks from us. And so we just trick or treated our way over there slowly and got there when it was pretty much when we were all ready to be done. And they played around a little bit and gave candy out and then we went home. So 
Oh, that's cute. Yeah. You know, Halloween, I think, is one of my favorite holidays. First of all, I got married on the holiday weekend in Las Vegas uh, years ago. You so did? I, yeah, like on the, we got married on the 30th, on October 30th. So our anniversary and Halloween's always the same. You pl- planned? Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. because, um, in fact, this is famous, but my wife wore a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader outfit Um the weekend, you know, for her costume, yeah, which was really awesome, <laughs> and um, and people, I was walking around, and people were probably thinking like, "Who's this loser right. with this Dallas Cowboy cheerleader?" But um, so the thirty first, or, or rather, so, they're saying he must have money. Yeah, the guy's got dough. Um, so I like the idea though of combining this real benevolent, fun holiday with just kind of laughing at the idea of ghouls and monsters and ghosts and stuff. Yeah. I, I think that's oh, a that's funny a good point. idea, you know? Yeah. Cause it's real gory and like dark. You know, if you go to these Halloween stores, they're really macabre, you know, and you, um, yeah, it's all kind of in good fun. You know, you yeah, it's all it candy and cutesy and even the little kids are running past, you know, somebody's head chopped off and <laughs> right, <laughs> it's right? Like, yeah, it's weird. It is kind of weird. It's great. It's so American. So as far as the new, oh, I should say, you know, while I was off for the last four weeks, I, the first three weeks went really fast and I didn't miss Facebook and I didn't miss reading the news. I mean, I, I did read the news, but there's a difference between kind of scanning the news and reading the news because you need to like think of a topic or topics or be really informed on topics in order to discuss them in a podcast. Right. So three weeks went by really quickly. I had a lot going on in my personal life. That's one of the reasons that I picked this time to take a break because we had a, (laughs) you guys are going to think like I'm such a privileged person, but we had a nanny transition. (laughs) But you have to keep in mind, like I've been really sick for two years, so I require help. You know, I, I, when you say transition though, it, it wasn't a nanny to a, She's transitioning guy. from right. No, it was uh, from one nanny to another nanny, and okay. that is a lot of work. Um, there's a you know, there's just a lot of work. I don't know. It takes some time for them to figure stuff out, and I'm probably not because I'm in the home too. It's even harder because if I were gone, I could just let her kind of dive into it and figure it out. But because I'm here, my daughter knows I'm here, and she's every 15 minutes running for me, you know, so I just, it was very time consuming and I wanted to put the time into it. We had, um, a transition to my daughter is going to a new school that's kind of far away. And in the first part of the break, I had to drive her every day to that school. So I just wasn't, I didn't really have the time and energy to do the podcast, but so that went quickly. And then the last week I started to get the itch. Like I really want to talk about some of the stuff going on. And so I'm glad to be back. I I apparently can't go longer than a few weeks without sharing my thoughts with the world that's not listening. (laughs) Right. Well, it's good to have you back. What is with the personality that wants to tell everybody what they think? And actually, I realized that social media is, this is my insight on social media. We are all communicating by making public statements rather than communicating with each other as friends. Mm. So like Mm -hmm. I I got off Facebook, I got off all, you know, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. I'm off all that stuff and nobody's calling me. Nobody's texting me. That's kind of done. Nobody's emailing me and I'm wondering what's happening with my friends. And so I'm calling them and finding out what's happening and texting more probably And when you're on Facebook, it's not like they're communicating with me on Facebook. They're communicating by making a public statement. Mm -hmm. Right? Here's my daughter's picture for 500 people to look at. Yeah. Hear ye, hear ye. The news (laughs) of the day is, you know, X, Y, Z. And a lot of people run their Facebook pages like newspapers. Like they're curating a newspaper and they have to like make sure that, oh, I saw this piece of news. All my friends need to know about this piece of news. 
and I'm going to, you, you know, if you were back in the olden days, if you were reading a newspaper and you saw an article, you wouldn't immediately pick up the phone and call your friend and go, did you see this in the front page of the New York Times? And then, you and might. then like hang up and then read the next up, article yeah. and then call that's, again. That's true. And, you know, it's like, or call 20 people. Or call 20 people, right. No, you'd read the paper and you would, you'd, you know, marinate in it. You'd think about it on your own. And then maybe when you were going to coffee with your friend, then you'd bring it up. You'd talk news with your friends. And if you were outraged, you'd think about writing a letter to the editor. Yes. Which, Can I, you know, and you'd have to take time and have to think about it. And yes, compose a letter and, and I think you put say, your thoughts together more um, clearly that way. You're not everything's not a reaction and then a statement, and so I don't know. That's kind of not. That's funny. It's a funny observation. We're all just communicating by public statement. Yeah, and good we point. and we feel like that makes us more in touch. You know. Anyway, yeah. we are more in touch. I mean, I wouldn't know. Like you, you texted me a photo of your child dressed up in in his costume, and I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't get to see those cute pictures of all my friends' kids in costumes if I wasn't on Facebook. But do you really need to see that? I mean, I just sometimes I think it's overwhelming. I don't need to, but it is kind of nice. I mean, I, I feel happy when I look at the pictures. Okay. You know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I suppose. I just think, like, before Facebook, the idea that this giant universe of people that you've ever known from high school on would kind of know about your life. Um, well, that's it was, not That was so unusual. But, yeah. It's, it was very unusual now that that's just taken for granted that, you know, oh, I've got to tell 500 people about every event in my life. <laughs> right. It's strange. Well, and now I'm to the point obviously where so I do this weekly podcast so it's not just it's not just here's a picture of my daughter but it's hey here's my thoughts on everything um and if I don't get that if I don't get to do that I start to feel kind of itchy like (laughs) people don't know what I think oh my god what am I gonna do <laughs> That's great. Yeah, someone is wrong in the world, <laughs> and I, and nobody to... knows that I disagree. This I, is horrible. Exactly. <laughs> it's like how is the world going to go on without me? <laughs> right. So narcissistic. So narcissistic. I I think these these platforms are making us more narcissistic. My favorite joke of um uh, the the comic that the dark comic. What's his name? Jessel Jesselnick or whatever. Yeah. Is when he was talking about people on social media, how when a tragedy happens and people do the thoughts and prayers thing. Yeah. And, you know, you'll get a hundred of those. And he said, you know what people are really saying um, in the midst of this horrible tragedy when you when you put something like a thoughts and prayers out is what about me? <laughs> yes. Look at me. Look at me. I'm so nice. What about me, though? I, I, have, I know I know. 50 yeah. people just got shot, but what about me? My feelings about that shooting are important and need to be <laughs> expressed yeah. and seen by everybody that I know. That was, it's a really dark observation on human it psychology. It is, but it's exactly sure. what's happening. It's weird. Um, I, I have those same urges. I, I tend to want to post news articles and make a statement and like do all this sort of lecturing on Facebook. Mm. And I, I just try to, to set rules for myself. Like on my profile, I won't share a lot of politics. I feel like that's not what it's for. If you're my friend, I'm not just constantly shoving my political opinion down your throat. Yeah. (laughs) What I'm doing is sharing my life with you and you know, what's going on in my life, not, what's going on in Washington. And then on my professional page, which you can follow at Sunny Loman on Facebook, typically is where I post stuff. Um, I have a rule that I, I will only post something funny. So that really, that pairs it down. I don't get to like display outrage. Mm -hmm. So that's what the podcast is for. Good. Yes. Welcome everybody. Um, So speaking of that, I guess the first thing 
I wanted to talk about was Gab. This Gab uh, dot com that got banned. Um, it got unpersoned. The company got unpersoned. And there's yeah. just a couple interesting things to say about this. I, I don't need to get into too much stuff, but we can get into like the tech companies and what can be done. It's obviously a problem. It can't just be ignored. And you can't just say, oh, uh, build your own company. <laughs> I mean, Gab is now proving that. First of all, Alex Jones built a an independent media organization like the Young Turks, right? It's an alternative mm-hmm. independent media organization. That's what he had going on. And the powers that be, which may be the government, but is certainly a handful of corporations, have decided that you can't have that. You can't be responsible and have that. You can't no. have your own choices there. His so we've thoughts got, can't impinge on your brain. Yeah. And, and so a bunch of corporations have decided that for everybody. And probably influenced by government agents. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I we don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes, but even overtly, there's been a lot of pressure put on them to, to do that kind of thing. So, so that happened. And now Gab isn't even an Alex Jones. Gab's, Gab's thing is, hey, you won't be a neutral platform. We, we will be a neutral platform. We will be free speech absolutists. Now, that doesn't include... Um, you know, you can't film a murder and put it on there. So, like, they, they definitely have standards, and they're like the old standards that Facebook and Twitter used to go by, where, right. you know, certain vulgar or, I don't know, vulgar is not the right word, um, violent things, th- you know, certain things would not be allowed. But, but yeah. after those very specific things, anything goes, and you can be a bigot and a racist, and you can be anything you want to be. You can express yourself. It's a neutral platform. We're not going to um, police content, except for these, you know, very narrow standards. Right. And Gab came out and advertised themselves that way as an alternative to the increasingly censored, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook. And because there's a market for that. Because people want that. Of course. And Facebook and Twitter and GoDaddy and PayPal have decided you can't have a neutral platform. They've decided that. So it's not just, you know, Facebook can do what it wants. It's their platform. It's Facebook saying, I don't, you don't, you're not allowed to choose something other than what we've decided to do. Right. So their their uh, host pulled out. Joyant is that part of Go, GoDaddy? So whatever, they lost but... their GoDaddy. They lost their URL. Joyant is not part of GoDaddy. I don't think. Okay. They lost their host, so they're down now. They're totally down. They're probably going to go back up. And when they do, I encourage everybody. I'm going to start using it. Yeah, I'm going to start I, being I on too. there on a regular that. basis. I've I've been on there for a while, but I don't. I'm not over there. I had an account. But now they're my they're gonna be one of my major I'm gonna go there every single time I post and post there. Mm-hmm. So you can you can like me there and you can get everything that I post on Facebook is gonna go over there too. Um I wouldn't have done that except that they're they don't get to decide for me what products and services I use. And by they I mean the, these corporations. Right. So they haven't just said, hey, look, we won't let you listen to fake news. We don't like that you we're going to ban what we think is fake news from our platform. Alex Jones. We're going to ban that and we're going to shadow ban Breitbart and some other stuff and everything. And you're not going to get these shitty opinions that we you know, we think are shitty. When you come to our platform, you're not going to really get this the right. You're not going to get much of the right. This is a leftist platform. That's what they've told us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now that's fine. I don't agree that they should do that. I think that they say they're a neutral platform. They should be a neutral platform. And otherwise, they're basically uh, committing fraud against us. And I also was listening to a really interesting podcast that was recommended to me where a guy was talking about how this is actually destroying long-term 
this is destroying the thing in America that makes our economy work, which is that you can count on things. Yeah. So if <laughs> if they came out and said, hey, here's our terms of service, they shouldn't be allowed to change that. No, it's a total breach. They shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, if you lease a space to open a store, a brick and mortar place, and you sign that lease, the landlord doesn't get to change the terms until the lease is expired. Right. And this is the kind of thing that we that they have they've decided they can change their terms of service. They've decided all of this stuff we have to agree no matter what, or we lose our business that we've created on these social media sites. And you know what's interesting, Sonny, is the analogy to residential real estate or real estate leasing or commercial real estate is there's all sorts of law that's built up throughout the country in every state that surrounds those leases. Like when you start to scratch the surface of a lease, you know, if you ever have a problem, you realize that there's books of case law, precedents and laws that surround, in other words, at some point it was like, okay, well, let's just have this lease. And then people had problems and conflicts. And essentially the landlord did come in at some point and say, okay, everybody get out. You know, I'm, I'm violating your lease. And yeah. the, the law came in and said, hey, wait a second, you can't do that to right. someone. And here's right. the boundaries. Are, you know, here are the legal boundaries and parameters of these relationships. Yes, you sign a contract and a lease, and you have so much discretion in that lease, but there are certain things you can't do that are against, like, the law, you know, that protects the rights of both parties. Right, because right, you, you spend a, a lot. Of, it does make sense, and it needs something like that. This is new, I understand. The Internet is new. We don't really know what we're doing. Um, but clearly, if you just equate it with any real-life, you know, real-world example pre-internet example of the same kind of thing and you start to see that you can't do this in to people in any other realm right so why are we allowing it on the internet there's something really wrong here and they are destroying the the thing that makes the american economy so good which is you know you can count on the rule of law and you can count on when when you sign a lease you can count on the fact that the landlord can't kick you out. And yeah. so you can then invest $100,000 in your business and in renovations and marketing and advertising and time and your life. You can invest that because you can count on the permanence of your and, contract. You know, and at some point you get to the point where, like, what if the government said, hey, you know, Republicans can't use the roads and stuff like that. And most people will say, well, those are utilities and, you know, the government can't discriminate. So there's already laws and this is private. But you start to get into a gray area when you're talking about Internet service providers um, and the sort of like material and the hardware and the backbone of the internet and who controls and runs that and the pipes and everything. I mean, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but there's some real serious gray areas when, you know, if we're going to allow these companies and particularly banks that are heavily regulated oh my God, right? by the by the federal government and you know MasterCard states and federal and PayPal Visa, coming around MasterCard, and saying PayPal. you can't do yeah. business, um, you can't bank because we don't like what you think politically, and not just that. Now you can't bank because PayPal banned Gab as well. You can't bank if you want to promote free speech. So it's, it's not even like they don't like what Gab is saying. They don't like that Gab exists as a platform for other people to say stuff that they want. So it's, I mean, it's like, I don't know, this is so clearly, this is like the ink and paper companies deciding what newspapers you can have. Yeah. Because That's they're just, I'm not going to sell ink and, ink and paper to, you know, half of the country's newspapers. And they're yeah, done. What bother, Overnight, what they're done. What bothers me is that, like, the first response I have to this is just moral outrage. You know, here's a company like Gap right. who on their, on their site, you know, the first thing you see is we believe in free speech. And that's why we exist, you know, to promote free speech and to provide a, a serious neutral platform for, you know, in the American spirit of completely free speech. So I personally value that and think they're awesome for doing that. And for other companies to come out and try and squelch that and to hate that and to try and destroy them 
I mean, it's just so anti-American. It's, it's so, so disgusting. I'm so, I'm so morally outraged. And if it, it reminds me of like when a terrorist attack happens and people go, the first thing out of their mouth is, hey, uh, let's not be Islamophobic now. It's like, no, the first thing out of your mouth should be, oh, my God, that's horrible. Right, right. <laughs> and so the first thing out of your mouth should not be, well, it's a private company, blah, 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 which you always hear from libertarians and objectivists. Yeah, I know it's a private company. That's still, it's freaking immoral what they're doing. And they're banding together and doing this. And guess what? The re- So I don't know if you guys, if all my listeners know what happened, but Gab, so what happened was the shooting at the synagogue, the guy had a Gab account and said some anti-Semitic stuff on it. And therefore, they're shutting down the company that allowed him to say some anti-Semitic stuff. So they're basically shutting down a company that's okay with free speech. The guy also had a Facebook account. Do you think PayPal banned Facebook? No. What about Louis Farrakhan's account? They haven't shut that down. Right. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds no, they're of not, counterexamples they're to not, this. They're not banning anti-Semitism. They're banning a company who's pro-free speech because that's what they're against. That's what they're against. And it's it's all of them at once, just like with Alex Jones, all at once. So you mm-hmm. know they're colluding. They're getting together a, a group of corporate elites. You know, this is the oligarchy in play, deciding what you are allowed to have in products and services in this country. And I am a pro-business, pro-free market person, totally. But that's not what we have. That is not what we have in this country. And I also, just because I'm pro-business doesn't mean I'm not against, that I'm like against contracts or implied contracts. Business doesn't work without the rule of law. And I think all of these companies are violating that. You know, they have taken Gab down, taken them down completely, shut them down. They'll probably be back up. But the point is, they're not operating right now. How many companies could survive not operating for a few weeks? You know, it's a major, major hit to their revenues. And so they've, they've done that, and they've done it because they're against free speech. They're immoral and evil. And I hope Period. you... I hope That's you right. uh, can't hear my maid vacuuming in the next room. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, um, the, I just, I, you know, I, I think the answer is the government actually does need to look at this from a, uh, are these companies actually violating uh, contracts? Yeah, and, and are they committing, that, that, I mean, they're really perpetrating a fraud. Yes. And there's all sorts of law uh, surrounding that in yes. terms of, you know, the types of service that they're providing and and the rules by which other people play. You know, we're we're not starting in the context of a purely laissez-faire economy here. We have a mixed economy where the government controls a vast swath of our economy, and we exist in that context, you know, where the government can threaten people, the government can threaten regulation, the government can regulate things, they do regulate things. And you know, you you can't just say, oh, you know, it's a private business. Yeah, in some circumstances that's right, but the primary value here is freedom of speech. At that's this, the real primary yes, value. That is the primary value, and that's an American value and a legal value. So it's both a cultural value and a legal value. And I I think I encourage everybody out there to think of it this way. It's it's an American value, you need to defend it. Um against these against these jerks. And They've just proven that this, this oh, go start your own media company if you don't like what the media are saying. Okay, Alex Jones did that. Go start well, your Gab own go start your own social media company if you don't like what Facebook and Twitter are doing. Well, Gab did that. Now, we can't start our own banks. If we did, the government would just tell that our own bank that we aren't allowed to decide that Gab can have, can bank. I mean, yeah. that's what we're coming to. So, I mean, yeah. that's a very regulated company. You think that they're not being told what to do? I don't think PayPal yeah. was told what to do by the by the government regulators, but I think they're getting pressure from from lawmakers. 
I know they are because that's actually been done publicly. And and they're getting pressure from their cohorts, you know, they're the other corporations, and they're just getting together and going, oh, yeah, we can do this. We can ban these people. We don't like them. We'll just ban them. PayPal disgusts me. How dare they? And then, oh, here's the worst thing, Doug. I don't know if this is worse, but this is also really bad. Gab writes a, an article defending itself, saying, look, this is why we do what we do. This is our defense of free speech, and we don't think that we should cancel free speech because there's a crazy person out there who, who shot up a mosque and it doesn't, or a, a synagogue. It doesn't have anything to do with free speech in general. Right. That was, you know, they wrote this really nice defense of their own platform and, and a neutral platform. And they posted it on Medium, and Medium took it down. They banned it. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. So not only are they not allowed to have a URL, they're not allowed to be hosted on anybody's computers, they're not allowed to bank, but they also can't even write about it and defend themselves. That's not news. You're being shut off from that news because the news people have decided that they don't want you to hear what Gab has to say, and they've already shut down Alex Jones, so where are you going to hear Gab's defense? And then they say, oh, Gab is just all right, because look, all they do is talk to Breitbart and, you know, it's like, well, you won't fucking talk to them. Yeah. Who else should they talk to? The New York Times. So. All right. That's that's the Gab news. Um, And then I had an epiphany about this caravan and racism (laughs) this morning, because once again, someone was arguing that anyone who's against this caravan of. Uh, what are they? Hondurans? Guatemalans? Central Americans. Central Americans. Um, if you're against this caravan just coming in and being allowed in, you're a racist. <laughs> Someone said that? Yeah. Preposterous. Well, I mean, you think so, but, you know, why would you be against them coming in and having jobs? You must be against brown people. <laughs> so... I'm having this argument with this person, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what this whole thing stems from when we're talking about immigration policy? And and really, this isn't even immigration policy. This is just simply border security, which I think is a separate issue from who should be let in and who shouldn't be let in. But the fact that we have the choice, that we get to decide, is indisputable as far as I'm concerned. I don't, you know, that's a foreign policy issue. That's a safety issue. That's a sovereignty issue. Yes. That's a separate issue from who who should we rationally let in and who shouldn't we? Right. You can't conflate the two. I think they're separate issues. It's a good point. So I'm 100% behind a secure border and American sovereignty and our right to choose who moves here and who doesn't. I don't want terrorists. I don't want criminals. I don't want fucking typhus and tuberculosis and this new strange polio uh, disease that is ripping through the country. I don't know if you've read the stories about yes. this. I don't mean to yeah. be an alarmist. There aren't that many children. It's always hitting children and they're, they're becoming disabled in the same way that polio disabled children. Mm-hmm. They don't know what it is. They don't know where it came from. They don't know anything about it. And I'm not saying it's coming from uh, immigrants, but you know, they, I don't want this kind of thing. I don't want the chance of these illnesses coming in here, and illnesses we know about. So um, that apparently makes me a racist, and the reason that it does is because I'm white. So You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Imagine if this caravan of people were a bunch of doctors and scientists and engineers. Um, you know, it's not about race. No. It's... First of all, there's the question of can these people, no matter who they are, if they were doctors and engineers or if they're migrant workers, they can't just crash the border. There's a sovereign. We have a sovereign country and we have to have a process, a legal process for people to come in. Otherwise, after this 10,000 comes in, another 10,000 would come in and maybe 100 million would come in. There, were, Anyone would just be let in, right? So you have to have a process. Oh, you're no being matter- hysterical, Doug. That's hysterical. 
Why it's, why do you think letting 7,000 in today will lead to 100,000 later? Why do you think that? Because I think in principle. Um, so, you know, if... <clears throat> so, first of all, there's the question of, you know, whether we have a process or not, whether we have a sovereign country. And that's it doesn't matter if they're engineers or whoever they yeah, are I don't first. care if it's 7,000 you know. Swedish doctors. You right. don't get to fucking crash my border. Right. You don't get to. Because and this is should, my country. This is our country. We have a right to say who comes in and who doesn't. We have a right to keep out people we don't want here. And now, sure, there should be some law around, like you've said this in the past, you can't, the law on immigration policy shouldn't be irrational. You can't say, you know, you're not allowed to bring in any redheads, so you, nobody's allowed to marry a redhead and bring them in. You know, you can't have that kind of thing. That right. that would be a violation of the rights of the citizens of the United States. So, but at the end of the day, this comes down to what's in the interest of Americans. And but the point of the point that you just made with redheads is that it's unfair from the perspective of our citizens. Right. So our citizens determine the policy. If the government arbitrarily or non-objectively disallows your redheads, you're actually violating the rights of our citizens arbitrarily. It's not right. objective policy. It's not about the Swedes, the 7,000 Swedish doctors. No. It's not, it's not about them. It's about us. Everything's from the perspective of us. We're, we have a government. We formed our government. We pay for our government. And we've delegated the right to use force to that government, that we've given that power to them to protect us collectively. That's the purpose of the government. Right. So, um, so bring it on, Trump. Bring the, the 15,000 troops to the border and keep these assholes out. I, I'm so outraged. And, and, you know, okay, that's like the, if they're not 7,000 Swedish doctors. There's seven, there are a lot of guys, and they're flying the flag of another country, and they're yelling about how much they hate our president, and they're yelling yep. about how much we owe them for something we did in their countries that, you know, I don't want this kind of person here. I don't. They're not looking for fucking jobs. But anyway, no, that's neither here nor there. Asylum. They've already been offered asylum by Mexico. So it's but clearly all, not all just about asylum. Stuff, all of that stuff is noise and details. Yes. I, I do think they're bad people. I don't want a single one of them. But even if they were good people and they were fucking white, I'm sorry, I'm swearing a lot. I'm really angry about this. But here's the epiphany I had is that if you accuse me of xenophobia and racism because I'm against this, it's because you are racist. You actually have absorbed and you believe that white people have a tendency to be racist. Otherwise, why would you would you tell a Hispanic person that they're racist for being against this caravan coming in illegally? All uh. the Hispanics that are against illegal immigration, is you, do you call them racist and xenophobic? Right. No, you don't. You only call white people racist and xenophobic. You assume, not that I have ideas... But that I'm because I'm white, I'm racist. And that is straight out of the fucking leftist white privilege playbook. Right. It's racist. So that's my epiphany. It's like the next time somebody says to me, or, or you, dear listeners, if somebody calls you racist, go, if I were Hispanic, would I be racist for holding this position? If I were well, black, would, would I be racist? Do you think it's a racist or, or, you know, is it because I'm white that you think I'm a racist? That's what you should say. And the answer is yes. Yeah, it's because you're white. Mm -hmm. So I'm angry. I'm so tired. And this is, this is racism against white people. Can we yeah, please be angry about this? This is disgusting, despicable racism. Well, not only that, it's it's positive bigotry, too, because why are you making assumptions about who's in this caravan? Like, just because they're Central Americans or something, they're necessarily good? Right. Or, you know, we don't... But the point yeah, because of all those, Central Americans are just hardworking, nice people. The, the, the people that want screening are really the non-racists, because they're saying, we don't know. Right. We don't know who these people are. We, we're the ones who want to figure out 
who's coming in and yeah. coming out and make that judgment. If you make the judgment that they're all bad or they're all good, it's the same kind of racism. You're yeah. saying they're all good or they're all bad. They're all, um, they're all good they because all Central Americans want to work hard and you're a racist because you're white. I mean, it's just, it's fucking gross. And um, yeah, I want screening. I want to know who's coming in. I'm not saying shut down the border and don't let anybody in who's brown. I don't think I said that. So I, I'm, I'm over it. But anyway, I think the proper defense is, um, are you saying I'm racist because I'm white? And it's true. Yeah. That's what they're saying. Yeah, and they'll say yes. Yeah. And then you can go, well, okay. End of conversation, racist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm right. done with you. So that's my thought on the caravan. And I don't really have much more to say about, uh, you know, I don't know what's really happening. I don't, I haven't, I haven't done thorough research to say for sure that I've heard reports that there are foreigners in there, like from overseas, some terrorists, things like the infiltrated by drug gangs. I mean, different things. I've heard, what did it, Mike Pence said that? Well, yeah, um, but this is this is the difference, too, between mass migration and individual migration, which very few people make this important distinction. When 7,000 people show up, at, you know, as our country trying to defend itself, how, how in the hell do we know who's in there? Maybe 6,500 out of the 7,000 are perfectly wonderful people, but 500 are bad. I want to know. Um, and it's not fair to the people who, like, where are these people going to go? Um, you know what else you know, these now, assholes if you, if you are one, doing? They're bogging down. They know that they're not eligible for asylum. They know it. And they're course. bogging down our asylum system. So imagine people who are actually being persecuted. They have right. to wait in line for two years because some 7,000 Central Americans have decided to crash our border and claim asylum. And they know that they're yeah. not going to get it. Great point. What about the people who are really seriously seeking asylum from persecution right now? There are. I, I read this the other day. There are 600,000 asylum cases right now waiting to be adjudicated. 600,000. And it's a two-year line. So. Um, and they know that and they'll get released and they're gaming the system. And yeah. I think another shame, shameful default here is our Congress. And the Republicans had yes. two years in control to try and get something worked out here where, you know, there are, and again, this is a third point, you know, we've talked about sovereignty, we've talked about the particular issue of who's coming in, but now there's the third point, which is our system is screwed up. It is Like the up. fact that someone can just come in and claim asylum and then get sent off into the country for two years. No matter who you know, they are, they, when we don't know anything about them. No, that's a complete default by our government and not protecting us. You know, you need yeah. to you need to have a serious um, process by which you review quickly an asylum claim. Well, These think, people are you can't just say I'm I'm a claiming asylum. No, you're not. If you wanted asylum, you would have already gotten asylum in Mexico. These people are just trying to game the system and use these loop loopholes and it's gotta right. be stopped. And they get goodies. Let's be real. They get goodies when they get here, even when they're illegal. They get of free course. school. They get better school for their children. They get better health care. They they're bogging down the ERs. I mean, everybody who's living in a place that doesn't have these immigrants, these illegals. I mean, you don't understand. You go to the ER in a in a state like California, and you know they're all they go to the ER for a cold because they don't have insurance and the ER can't turn them away. Right. So it's the doctor's office for everybody. Anyway, um, so you go in there with a real emergency and you're kind of in line. Um, it's not good. It's not good. And I, I think there are a lot of things in the policy. I've had a lot of friends of mine who've gotten married to an American and the crazy stuff that they have to do and the, the amount of time it takes for them to be able to work here. I mean, it's just insane what they have to yeah. go through. The yeah. paperwork, the bureaucracy, the time, it's... So there are a lot of things about our immigration policy that are really screwed up. I mean, people legitimately coming here to work or get married, and they're good people, and they have, they're have they easy to background check, they don't have a criminal record, they don't have a disease, they have a good job. That should, that should be a slam dunk. Right, get them through. Um, but it's not. 
and and Congress really has dropped the ball. It seems like that's what they do. They don't. Congress has left everything up to the president and the courts. Yep, exactly. Right. And it's like they don't even exist anymore. And it's causing chaos in this country, and it's causing a lot of anger and hysteria, and people get very worked up about Trump being president. It used to be that a president didn't have a ton of power. Um, but Congress is just not doing their job. Well, for, for decades, even I mean, especially the Democrats were the ones who were telling us, hey, we have to control the border. And they were right. And, you know, you see these speeches by, you know, going back to the 90s from Clinton and Obama and the Hillary's and Feinstein and Pelosi. They all wanted to control the border. And, you know, part of the reason for that, too, is, you know, their constituents don't want to compete with low wage migrants, you know. But anyways, whatever the case is, they were for controlling the border. And now right. because it's Trump, now we can't have any policy. We just let in caravans of yeah. tens of thousands well, of people. Well, you know, the child I mean, ripping only happened under Trump, even though it happened under Obama. Oh, of course. So and, it's all propaganda. And, it is. And now we have a president who's made that a big issue. So they're making it a big issue just for political points when really this should be a congressional debate. You know, people have different views of how to restrict people. I get that. But there should be a national debate. Like, what is our policy going to be? Let's make it as efficient as possible. Yeah. Let's try and get the good guys in here and keep out the bad guys. And let's, keep out, the bad, let's keep out the, the bad guys in such a way that we're not bogging down our immigration system. I mean, you wonder, you complain about how long it takes for a legal person, uh, you know, legal immigration. And but you don't then complain about the fact that these illegals are bogging down our immigration system. Right. So. Right. Well, I, you know, I, my my little joke today or epiphany was, you know, if you're one of these leftists, like you know the Silicon Valley people, like uh, Google and Zuckerberg and Facebook and Soros and all the people that are pushing this kind of stuff, they they have hundreds of billions of dollars. You let's send these people to your house. Right. You have the land. Why don't you, have you the start money. a refugee camp? On, yeah. your, on your fancy lawn. Put them through college, you know. You start a refugee camp on your property, and you take all these tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of people that want to come in. You spend your billions on them. And, you know, it, it, but no, they sit in their castles surrounded by walls and armed guards. And where do these people go? You they know, go all over the rest of the country and, and my, my instinct tends to like favor like I, I don't ever want to disparage rich people and say, oh, you have so much, you know, look at you talking to us and you're just rich. Like, I've never thought of that as something no. to look down on somebody for. I, I admire wealth and I admire wealth creation. And my instincts have been to cringe every time somebody uses those arguments. But as we increasingly get into this weird place where it seems like. It really is this like rich leftist elite who has no idea about the consequences of their policies. And just look at Trump and, you know, Trump won because of these issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's real. People who are living lives in lower end communities are really impacted by this stuff. And if you think, oh, it's no big deal, you're, you're hysterical over 7,000 people breaking into the border. There's 20 million illegals in this country. If 7,000 are allowed to crash and come in, there will be more. And there are, there's already like this, we're in like a major peak, I think, right now or something. Um, but the people who live in the communities where they're really affected by this are having a really big problems. Crime and fear. And I, was, I have a, a French nanny. And she talks about, this is obviously taking place in France, but she lives in the north of France. And she says when she's home... She has to be conscious of how she dresses. If she dresses, she, you know, she has to cover up. Wow. Yeah. Or she'll be harassed and it's scary for her by Arabs. Yeah. So yeah, they want to get to put the, that's why they got to put the burqa on everybody now. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't have to wear a burqa, but she says she can't wear anything too attractive. Right. She doesn't want to attract right. attention and be too sexy and. God, sick me. That's what the French women are dealing with in communities where immigration has really harmed them. And this is why Marine Le Pen was getting a lot of votes 
Um, so if you're sitting in your house and you're not affected by illegal immigrants or mass Central American immigration, legal or un- or otherwise, um, check yourself, man. I mean, talk to some people who live where they're actually being affected. Talk to someone in Minneapolis who's affected by 100,000 Somalis being dumped into the middle of a welfare Swedish welfare community. <laughs> it's freaking exactly. crazy there. So anyway, well, that's, you know, that's the end of our show today, but I've got to end with a joke. So here's the joke I have. Ready? All right. Yep. A cabbie picks up a nun. The cab driver stares at her. She asks him, why is he staring? And he says, I've always had a fantasy to kiss a nun. He's a dirty guy. She says, I'll kiss you if you're single and Catholic. The cab driver says, I'm both. The nun says, okay. So she kisses him in a way that would make a hooker blush. And back in the cab, though, the driver sa- starts crying, and he's, and he's feeling guilty. I lied. I'm married, and I'm Jewish. The nun says, that's okay. My name is Kevin, and I'm going to a Halloween party. <laughs> Bravo. Little Halloween joke. Love it. <laughs> that's it for our show today hey I appreciate each and every one of you listeners please leave comments on the show and let us know what you think write us emails tell us what you want us to talk about uh, we'd love to hear from you call in a joke at 707-681-5834 or you can call in a comment if you enjoy the show consider becoming one of our Patreon uh, patrons at I always get this wrong patreon.com slash house of sunny <laughs> We have a bunch of really awesome people in our elite squad over there. And we have a private Facebook group where we like to joke around and we're completely fan funded. You get lots of cool rewards like mugs, t-shirts, access to that Facebook group. So go over there. Two bucks a month is all you need to get into the Facebook group. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the House of Sunny podcast. Go check out Sunny on YouTube at her channel, House of Sunny. Everything Sunny does is fan funded. And because she's likely to get kicked off and demonetized on every platform.